she's still over a moonlit sky. Why she was sure to wait for She killed sight to people blind. Endless to where their heart I run, I ride to reach a line of
Good evening. Hi, my name is Bryce Rosenblum. I'm the founder and producer of New York Winter Jazz Fest. It's a pleasure to have you all here. Uh, this is our final week of jazz talks, um, Winter Jazz Fest talks that we launched a few years ago. And a few years ago, we- Good evening. Uh, Hi, my name is Bryce Rosenblum. I'm the founder and producer of New York Winter Jazz Fest. It's a pleasure to have you all here. Uh, this is our final week of jazz talks, um, winter jazz fest talks that we launched. Okay, I'm back, sorry. Technical difficulties. Um, we launched the Jazz and Gender series, conversation series uh, a couple years ago. And this year we are thrilled to partner with the New School and uh, the Berkeley uh, Institute of Jazz and Gender Justice. Um, and uh, it's been an incredible experience working with uh, a team of uh, experts, colleagues, friends, and um, this year we've been able to produce, present uh, three different conversations and go really in depth, more than we've been able to in past years. Um, so I just want to thank everyone for being here while we can't be here in person, and I promise Next year, 2022, we're going to make every effort to be there in person. We'll probably have a virtual experience as well. Uh, but I want to pass the mic over to Asia Burrell Wood, who is our host. Thank you, Asia. And uh, I look forward to the intriguing, inspiring conversation uh, to come. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bryce. I'm so glad to be here and um, be hosting. Uh, what's going to, I know it's going to be a dynamic conversation today. My name is again, Asia Burrell Wood, and I'm the managing director of the Berkeley Institute of Jazz and Gender Justice. And I just wanted again to welcome everyone to the third and final Jazz and Gender Talk series tonight is Reflection on Gender Bias. So um, for all of our attendees, please feel free to comment and ask questions through all throughout our event tonight. I'll be fielding questions both from the chats on Facebook Live and our Zoom web webinar, and we will have time for these responses uh, both during uh, the event and towards the end tonight. Today's talk will be um, the third of three conversations around gender that have been taking place over the months of January, February, and March. Uh, I wanted to take a moment to give a bit of context as to why we feel these conversations are so important. Winter Jazz Fest has been centering talk series events around gender for about the past three years with many different participants from a variety of backgrounds and realms of experience and expertise have participated. This is the first year that we've had the opportunity to have three conversations centered on gender during the talk series. So I wanted to say a big thank you to Bryce um, and, and also our, um, our partners who I'll be introducing and all of our participants and many other members of our fast growing community of individuals working to expand this conversation. And saying all that, um, I want to introduce the partners for this series. The first partner is the School of Jazz and Contemporary Music at the College of Performing Arts at the New School. It is also the alma mater of our one of our panelists today, Sarah Elizabeth Charles, who is now an adjunct professor there. And usually we are used to seeing Sarah in the hosting position, but I'm so excited for tonight um, for her to join the panel. And so we get to hear from her directly. Uh, at the School of Jazz, uh, Sarah developed both the Jazz and Gender course with along with Caroline Davis and was at the Jazz and Gender series for as well as the Jazz and Gender series for about four years now in an effort to provide a safe space for productive conversations around gender and Black American music. The School of Jazz and Contemporary Music and College of Performing Arts started partnering with the Winter Jazz Fest in this effort in the spring of 2020 and we're and very, they're, I'm sure, very happy to be doing it yet again. Our second partner is the Berkeley Institute of Jazz and Gender Justice, which was founded by Terry Lynn Carrington in 2018. Uh, this, we specifically seek to engage in the pursuit of jazz without patriarchy and in making long lasting cultural shift in jazz and other music communities, recognizing the role of black American music 
can play in the larger struggle for gender and racial justice and equity. The, our institute is the first of its kind and we are so grateful to be partnering with the New School and Winter Jazz Fest for the curation of this series and these conversations and moving them forward together. This work is collective. And now I would like to introduce our amazing moderator, and that is Nayama Saf Safia Sandi. And I'd like to share a little bit about her work. Uh, Nayama Safia Sandi is a New York-based curator, producer, educator, and multidisciplinary artist. Sandy's cur curational practice delves in the human story. Through the critical lens of healing, history, migration, music, race, and ritual, She's an agitator who calls into question and makes sense of the nature of modern life and to celebrate our shared humanity in the process. Her aim is to leverage history, the visual, written, and performative arts, chiefly those of the global Black diaspora, to tell the stories we know in ways we have not yet thought to tell them and to lift us all to a higher state of historical, ontological, and spiritual wholeness in the process. And indeed she does. We are so glad to have you. Thank you for moderating tonight and we'll now turn it over to Nayama. Thank you everyone. Thank you so much, Asia. Such a pleasure to be here. It's an incredible honor to be speaking with my illustrious panelists this evening, which I will now introduce. First, we have joining us this evening, Lakeisha Benjamin, voted the 2020 Downbeat Critics Poll Rising Star Saxophonist and up and coming artist of the year by the Jazz Journalists Association. Dynamic saxophonist Lakeisha Benjamin fuses traditional concepts of jazz, hip hop and soul with her electric presence and fiery sax work. As the band leader of Lakeisha Benjamin and the Soul Squad, she melds the vintage sounds of James Brown, Maceo Parker, Sly and the Family Stone, and the meters with soaring dance floor worthy rhythms. Benjamin's grooves take the classic vibe to a whole new level with sultry alto saxophone, creating something special on every cut. Next, I'll introduce Sarah Elizabeth Charles, of course, the wonderful architect of this series of conversations. Uh, definitely have to, to shout that out and raise that up. Sarah Elizabeth Charles is a vocalist and composer as well as a teaching artist based in New York City. Charles's musical output has been described as, quote, a genre of one by Downbeat Magazine, soulfully articulate by the New York Times, and an unmatched sound by Jay-Z's Life's and Times. Her critically acclaimed sophomore project, Inner Dialogues, released in 2015 on Truth Revolution Records, features her band along with co-producer, special guest, and one of our panelists this evening, Christian Scott Etunde Ajua. Her third album, Free of Form, is now available everywhere on Rope -a Dope and Stretch Music and features Scope as well as Christian Scott as co-producer and special guest. In 2020, she was selected as one of the five members of Joe's Pub's working group as a recipient of the New York City Women's Fund Grant in support of her band's fourth project to be released this year, and as a Chamber Music America New Jazz Works Grant recipient. Christian Scott Etunde Ajua, or Chief Christian Scott Etunde Ajua is a two-time Edison Award-winning and five-time Grammy Award-nominated sonic architect, multi-instrumentalist, composer, producer, designer of innovative technologies and musical instruments, as well as the founder of Stretch Music record label and app. Since 2002, Ajua has released 12 critically acclaimed studio recordings, three live albums, and one greatest hits compilation. He's also the progenitor of Stretch Music, a jazz rooted and genre blind musical form that attempts to stretch jazz's rhythmic, melodic and harmonic conventions to encompass multiple musical forms, languages and culture. Since Ajua's emergence onto the jazz music scene, he has been a passionate and vocal proponent of human rights and an unflinching critic of injustices throughout the world. I'm so pleased to have you all joining us. If y'all would turn your cameras on. Hello. <laughs> um, I'm so grateful to be in conversation with y'all tonight. Um, I do want us to start by sort of framing 
what do you believe to be the most authentic version of yourself as a human being, as an artist? Whoever wants to answer first can. Well, I guess I'll go first. Um, you know, I think for me, um, it's it's really difficult to to separate the artist from the human being, right? And so, you know, more often than not, the members of my band they always make fun of me because you know it's there's this concept and idea that when you walk onto a bandstand, that you transform into something else. And so most of the, the folks in my band always make fun of me because they feel like when I walk onto the bandstand, I become, you know, all of the things that they see behind the stage are highlighted, or heightened, right? To me, I think for, for me and to me, um, you know, I think that the, the, the difference is really, you know, and when, you're, when you're growing in this music, you're learning to play, you know, most people take all of these pieces of the great masters and they try to make a mashup to create a composite, which they sharpen and then that ends up being their sound. And of course, that was my process is most people's process. So even as I say myself as an artist, that also means Louis Armstrong, that also means Freddie Hubbard, that also means Billie Holiday, right? Because we are all those mashups. But to me, it always lies in you being the most you, right? Um, having the ability to, to go back and excavate the things that really make you feel. And, and to me, I also think that's a big part of making really good records, right? If I can make a record that I want to listen to that touches me, that captivates me, then more often than not, people will also be riveted by it. So to me, that's really the idea in a nutshell. Yeah, I love, I love so much of what you what Christian just said and can identify with it a lot too. I think, um, you know, for me, the journey of, of like finding the most authentic version or not even finding, but like allowing that most authentic version of myself to come out um, really had to do with keeping uh, keeping the focus on, on me, <laughs> on myself and sort of like tuning out the perception of others as much as possible. Um, I feel like so often in my in my own experience, because that's the only, only experience I can speak to, you know, the sort of penetration of other people's perception of me um, or what other people expect out of me or could, could potentially or had, had the potential impact of like affecting um, what would come out, you know, uh, you know, trying to reflect certain things back in order to receive, you know, those types of interactions with the world um, are, are habits that I've had to break throughout the course of my life um, and things that I've really had to look at and excavate. Um, I love that word. Um, and uh, things that I still, to this day, you know, have to have to work on. But the the sort of, the result of that has been kind of this, um, I don't know, I tell my students a lot because I teach as well. And um, something that I tell my students a lot is the idea that, and I, an idea that kind of seems corny or silly, but it's like the idea that we're the only ones you know, Christian's a twin, right? So, you know, we're, the, we're only, there are only one of us on this planet, you know, even you and Kyle, True. you know, there's only one of you and one of Kyle, right? So like, it, there's only one of us. And so what is that light? What is that authentic self? Who is that authentic self? And what are we doing on this planet if not to let that authentic self shine through? <laughs> you know, it's a little like life could be really pointless or futile um, if, if we don't do the work I, in my mind. To, to excavate that that part of ourselves. Um, so I'm really trying to do it as actively as possible, but it really starts with like tuning the world out a little bit and checking in and pausing and being quiet. And all of those things um, have helped me a lot. That's fascinating. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think when I think of my authentic self, I've always, I, I almost didn't have the, the, the trouble of finding out who I was until the music business came along. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like I was always taught that who you are is what you're gonna play. No matter, you know, you can transcribe all the Charlie Parker you want, transcribe all the train, transcribe all the Billy Holiday, everything you're trying to do, but it's gonna come out in your way because you can only play your experience mm -hmm. and what you've learned and what you've done. So I find that it's really easy for me to be my authentic self because my authentic self wants to relate to my audience. I want to, I want to heal with them. I want to teach with them. I want to share the culture with them. I want to bring them a true con congreg congregational African kind of experience in my shows because I believe that that's what the music that's where the music breathes and breathes and lives. It's not like I appreciate the collegiate experience, but I almost think that that's almost like a boot camp to get you into the real stage in the real world. But 
the times that I found adversity is when, when I leave the stage and I find that there is a business and the business has an idea of what an authentic artist should look like. And it's almost like the authentic part of the artist is the gimmick that they will sell for you. Right. So you're not going to, if, if you're authentically charismatic, they're like, oh, that's what we're going to sell. So, you know, it puts a lot of pressure on you for that. But I always try to encourage my students and every, everyone that I work with to find out what it is that makes you tick, like what it is that your soul desires and what you need on a daily day basis. Like, do you do music because you like it and it's fun and it's beautiful? Or do you music do music because it's breathing in your body? And if you couldn't play, you, you wouldn't even be here anymore. So I try to think of things from a, a deeper place like that. Like I'm here, God has a message for me, it has a message for the people and that, that's what I'm doing. I try to hold on to that idea and whatever self-healing things I need to do, whatever things I need to do with my body, my food, my mind, that's where I have to stay in order to just, I guess, tune out the noise because the audience and the people and the fans, they're here for that. They're not here for the gatekeeper. They're not here for the Jazz Times cover. They're not here for any of that mess. They came to the show to see the authentic you and support you, and that's what people really want. So that's just my two cents on like when I feel like I'm my authentic self, when I'm all tuned out and I'm focused on you know, my individual projects, and they all have a different message, but they all have a, just, I guess, a reflection of where I am in my life. It's, like a, it's almost like a snapshot of this is where I am today, and maybe in two years I'll be somewhere else, and maybe if I want to lease five CDs at once, I was in five different places, and that's the experience I have. Thank you so much. That was perfect. And it's actually a great segue into my next question. Um, so has there been a time in your career, and you can you know, be as transparent about that as you want in terms of naming names, uh, but has there been a time in your career where you have felt like you could not be yourself, like the forces of the market of whatever the situation was kind of like made you feel like you couldn't be in tune with yourself in some way? Is that question for me or just all it's of us? It's for everybody, yeah. You can answer if you want. Oh, God, I'm talking, yeah. Well, the, like I said, the times I felt it is when it's come directly to the art, maybe the record label has an idea of what's popular and what's not popular which is funny in the realm of jazz, what's popular, but they have this idea of what I should be. And I think sometimes as a woman too, they have an idea. You're not allowed to just be a woman and not be some type of sexy or attractive or, you know, some, the whole goal of it is to put your face on this cover. I've done so many festivals where before I was a headliner, the, the whole poster was my picture. And then it'd be like Chick Corea, Kenny Garrett, Herbie Hancock, but the, the festival poster is my picture. So, and I always found that funny. I'm like, everywhere I go, the, fo the festival poster is my picture, but, you know, I'm on the stage, you know, when you're walking in. So, yeah. <laughs> I, I got to piggyback off of that. Um, <laughs> sorry, I just fell over because of the Pisha. I've had the same experience, <laughs> the same exact experience. Um, I, I actually just told a story to my class. I had a, my jazz and gender class happened right before this discussion. And I told them I would be telling this story and some of them are here. So I feel like I gotta, I gotta stay true to that. Um, it, it's more like for the, the younger, um, maybe female identifying or non-binary identifying individuals who are watching today. Um, uh, this idea that we have to appear a certain way um, as young women or young non-binary identifying humans on the stage or present a certain way um, uh, is something that like was, that it, it enveloped me when I was coming up. You know, I started singing this music when I was 11. I started performing um, when I was 12. And by age 17, I consciously made a decision to start wearing looser fitting clothing on stage because of the experiences that I was having on stage. And I still, to this day, I've embraced it because it's just more comfortable. So I just, do, I just do it. But it's really interesting for me to reflect back on that time um, because if I was wearing certain things on stage, between the audience and the band that I was playing with, the comments were just, just got in the way of, of everything else, of the creativity, of the space, of the music. Um, and I didn't wanna have to, to worry or think about that. And so I made a very conscious decision to just change what I would wear on stage. And that, um, that idea, that sort of, I was 17, you know, I was, I was a kid, my brain wasn't fully developed. So that, that decision, um, that I made 
and that feeling that I could not be myself, that I couldn't wear what I wanted to wear on stage and be the artist that I wanted to be simultaneously. So I had to make it to make a choice, you know, um, again, doesn't feel like as big of a deal today because of my own tastes. And um, but I wonder, too, how how if I hadn't had that experience, um, you know, what type of OK, yeah, we're being vulnerable today. What type what my development would have looked like? Um, you know, what my own relationship to my own gender identity, sexual identity, how that would have developed potentially differently um, if I hadn't had to worry about that, if that wasn't something that that was commented upon. Um, and I, I, I won't know, you know, what that would have been because I had the experiences that I had. Um, but that idea that, you know, as, the, as, as young as that, I had to think about those those things in relationship to my creative space. These are things that not everybody has to think about. And I feel like it's important to share these types of experiences because I think they're common. Um, as Lakeisha just pointed out as, in, as adults and as I just shared, you know, even as young as teenagers or younger. Thank you for sharing that. I'm sorry, Krishna, I just wanted to oh, no. tell her, thank you. Yes. <laughs> that, yeah, that's that's mad real from those of us who've like been cat called in the streets since we were like eight and nine years old that's super real and I think it's really important to highlight please go ahead and answer thank you oh no worries you know I, I think you know for, for me my experience has been a little bit different you know I think the subject matter is a little different um, you know in terms of you know when we speak about what you're expected to wear and what you're you know expected to look like and, and these projections that the industry has on you um, obviously, I haven't gone through the same things um, that 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 they have gone through, but you, there are vestiges of those things that exist in the male space as well, right? And and also from the black male space as well, right? Um, I'm a person that grew up in a in a cultural space where when you played this music from its root cultural space, you had to be breath, dressed in a uh, you know a Savile Road suit and a Brioni tie to play this music. And obviously that's not our stilo. So, you know, there's friction in those moments, but, you know, the question makes me think of an experience that I actually had a couple of weeks ago. This is really recent, uh, where we were having a conversation with a, a group of folks in, in the industry here in Los Angeles uh, that were trying to work as uh, an attache to our business um, to spaces like Netflix or Disney for uh, film scoring things. But all these projects are coming in and they're trying to broker on our behalf. And as we were having the conversations to try and figure out what the deal was going to be, uh, the, the person at the head of that, that specific company um, asked me, you know, if there were going to be some things that, you know, I wouldn't be comfortable scoring. And obviously I, I laid it all out and was really clear that I, I have some pretty uh, strict lines. You know, I'm not a person that is uh, is is open to the idea of, of writing music for films that deals with my culture and the women in my culture disparagingly, right? And so those were considerations of mine. And her reply was, um, and this was really odd to me. She said two things. She said, um, well, you know, if I bring you a movie and it's a, a jazz movie and it's about Billie Holiday or Miles Davis, you know, there's going to be heroin in it. Right. We can't quote, we can't make a movie about Miles Davis without heroin. Right. And to that immediately, my immediate reaction was, well, are there movies about George Washington where they depict them pulling teeth out of enslaved person's mouths and putting in his mouth? Because each every person that has a biopic, there are elements of their lifetimes that we don't deal with. Right. But when you're dealing with our cultural space, that is is just more fuel for the fire. So, so, so I think we all go through those things and those 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 spaces in different ways. Um, you know, I think you know in, even in terms of the list of questions that we got before and some of the things that I saw in Glean, um, what made me really um, excited about having this opportunity to speak in this frame is to to potentially open a dialogue about how we change those things, right? And to me, you know, when she said that, obviously we didn't do the deal. I'm not going to make a deal with this person to 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 actually essentially be relegated to being denigrated in every space that you can be 
you know? But a big part of that is also making sure that we build the institutions that we need to build to make sure that we're not dispossessed and that those things are not superimposed on us without their actual actually being answers, right? To that end. So, you know, it's I think it's 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 a really complicated dynamic in that we are doing this in a space where there is a hundred year history of this type of energy being superimposed on to us. Um, but what is different from my experience to that of Buddy Bolden or Freddie Keppard at the turn of the last century is, is that we own our masters. We have our own record spaces. We have our own companies to be able to fight those things and to say, well, if that's how you feel, that's fine. But we have options to be able to build these things for ourselves. So we don't need you. Lay it with your chest, yes. Hey. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, there's just so much there. I, I'm gonna go off, off the questions a little bit. Um, just in particular, like we're in a pandemic. They were also in a pandemic a hundred years ago. You know, there's this spate of uh, extrajudicial violence against black people. Again, like it is just exactly cyclical, the same situation again. And we have to beg the question, like, are we gonna be here again in a hundred years? I would hope not. Um, and I hope that these conversations that we're having now really end up spurring themselves into action and change. And that said, what do you personally feel like was a turning point for your unapologetically standing on your own vision as an artist? I can answer that. Um, for me, it's when I decided that I didn't want to just make records anymore. I didn't want to put out albums and follow the game plan of album, tour, you know, merchandise. And I started to realize that this music for me is about leaving a legacy behind. To me, it's about passing down a generational thing to people and to, I don't want to say furthering the culture because that's not exactly it. This, this, this is a kind of music that was passed down from the masters all the way down to us. And I, and I wanted, and I thought to myself one day, you know, we're so busy dealing with the business and trying to please everybody. When it's all said and done and people look back and look up my name, Lakeisha Benjamin, what will I have left for them? What type of honor would I have given them? What would, what have I inspired them to be? Would I inspired them to be great saxophone players? Would I have inspired them to be great people? Would I have inspired them to strive to be the best person they could be? So those are the, the type of things that I was kind of starting to focus on. And at that, at that point, it started, it started to kind of block out the noise of like, I remember when Sarah was telling her story, I remember when I was first coming up going to jam sessions in New York City, I didn't think about it, but uh, a bass player recently showed me a picture of me at this place, Cleopatra's Needle, sitting in. He's like, this is the first place I met you. And I was looking at the picture and I was like, where am I? He's like, you're right there playing the solo. And I was like, I don't see myself. And I looked closer and I used to go out to these jam sessions wearing three hoodies on. I had three hoodies on, some Tims, in order to find a way to blend in with my colleagues so that they wouldn't just see me as, oh, Lakeisha's so cute. I, I could actually get a space to take a solo to get the time to learn and grow into the artist I was gonna become. It's like, I don't know if women get the space to grow. It's almost like as soon as you come to the session, you have to be at your highest level. While I feel sometimes the males, they get the space to kind of spend a couple of years sh shucking and jiving, and then they get their chance to go. So as I realized that, and I also teach at Jazz and Lincoln Center, and I'm like, some of my students actually come up to me and ask me, you know, Ms. B, would you take me to a jam session so that I can see the way the culture and everything goes? And, and, and I look at them when they come in, I can see the, the kind of sadness in their eyes when somebody doesn't take them seriously, when they ask them, oh, are you here with the drummer? Are you carrying that for your boyfriend? Or are you doing these type of things? So I think I decided that I, I don't want to be the standard, but I would like to be a great example for other women coming up and other people coming up as to you can do what you want, you can own your masters, you can own your space, you can own your truth, and you don't have to submit to these record companies, you don't have to submit to these film industry people, you can actually make the art that reflects your people in the most positive light possible so that when someone looks back, they can see, they can smile and look like these are kings and queens and this is not a situation of, you know, I guess, moving slavery again. Subservience. Yes. Um, I mean, as a, a person who's like in a weird place such that I'm occupying all of these different spaces within art and culture, 
I so feel you so hard. It's such a difficult balance to strike, but ultimately I'm always thinking about how do I kick the door open and leave it open for who's coming behind me, right? Um, so for the next person who wants to take on that question, please. Yeah, you know, I'm thinking about, um, you know, this, this question, like the unap unapologetically standing in your own vision, you know, and I feel like it, it's, uh, it can be hard to do that if, um, if your vision isn't aligned, aligned with the space that you're existing in or that you're wanting to create in. Um, Lakeisha, what you just shared made me think of that. It's like, what happens when you, or how does that vision potentially get shaped and molded slightly differently when your identity isn't synonymous with the context, <laughs> you know, that it has to, that it's existing in. Um, I'm thinking about that a lot. I'm gonna be thinking about that hours and days and probably years after this conversation. Um, so thank you, Nayama, for, for these, <laughs> these questions. Um, it's, uh, I think it's important to consider though, because, you know, I think that the inherent effect um, of inherent biases that exist within society on, in relationship to our own vision is like, step one, <laughs> at least for me, it's step one. It's like, okay, well, again, circling back to kind of that first answer that I gave um, just about perception, outside perception of self and how that's affected the molding of, of who I am in this world and how I've really tried to quiet that um, and create space and, and kind of protect my spiritual space as much as possible so that I can like listen to my insides and, and tune out everything else, um, you know, it can be really hard to exist in this industry to really zoom in for a second in relationship to this music um, and be a female. I, I, for me, it's I found it really interesting and really difficult and really rewarding to exist in this industry as a multiracial female of color, um, unapologetically attempting to see her vision through. Um, it's... Uh, it's been a challenge. <laughs> and I say, you know, I say it's also been rewarding and all sorts of other things because it's it's given me the sh uh, a certain amount of strength that I wouldn't trade for anything. Um, but it's, it hasn't been welcomed a lot of the time. And I think that's important to say, um, you know, oftentimes the, the responses that I get to what I'm releasing are, you know, well, Sarah, we like that sort of like that soft song or that mellow, you know that mellow piece but this like social and like political stuff like I don't know about that that's too much like that's you know it, it, there's certain things and certain characteristics and certain expectations again um that can uh don't inhibit me from realizing and from really attempting to commit to or committing to my vision for 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 who I am and not even vision for who I am but just realizing that and living that and being that and moving through the world um but I think it's important to acknowledge that that it's not always welcome. Um, and just to say, because I'm I'm really curious to have that conversation. Because and I'm because I'm because I'm also curious about what Christian said before about attempting to shift um, shift things so that there is more space, so that we can break down that door for future generations, as Lakeisha pointed out. Um, so that it's it's just a broader stage that looks a lot different than it does right now. I think this has already been perfectly answered, but I'll just add a, just a little tale to it, I guess. Um, I think one of the things that's difficult, but also really beautiful about this culture of music is that there is, you know, no matter what your perspective is on it, there is always, there always has to be this element of, you know, this unapologeticness, right? The music is that from the seeds of what it is, right? So we all have different perspectives on that, right? Like my experience is gonna be different, you know, from your experience or the next person's experience. But I think, you know, that's a huge part of the process, you know, in, in this culture of music in terms of what the history has been. What I'm more concerned with in this moment is, you know, what are the things that we need to do to transition from having to learn through suffering and marginalizing and otherizing people and getting into the space where, you know, those energies don't exist, right? And, you know, if, if we're being honest about it, 
you know, there, there are so many different frames on this music that are, are really, you know, these glass ceilings everywhere. Right. No matter what your entryway into this music is, there's something right. I have conversations with friends of mine, you know, that have, you know, pejorative and belittling feelings about people that don't come from our ethnic or racial background contributing in this music. So there's there's always vestiges of that. It just becomes about what we need to do to grow out of that. And also, you know, for for Sarah and I, obviously, we've worked together for a very long time. Right. And so I've learned so much from her about, you know, just watching her react and just watching like this regal queenly energy everywhere she is. That also helps me with younger ladies that I'm dealing with and teaching and bringing up from New Orleans to be able to impart things to them. So I think it also requires you paying attention. You know, like Lakeisha, you said you showed up, you had the hoodies on. And so it's like you you almost have to figure out your own veiled way of getting into what this environment is. But, but ultimately, it has to shift away from that. Everyone should be welcome because everyone is valid. Beautiful responses. Thank you so much. Can I say something real quick about that? I know that we so, some of it may sound like we're dwelling on like some of the negative aspects of how gender and all this is. is, is but it's it, important. It's, it's important, but I also think it's important to realize that like, so I haven't worked with Christian pretty much at all. I've seen him on the, on the fly. I know his work. I study his work because I, I appreciate what he's about. But yeah. the fact that he exists mm -hmm. also affirms everything that I do when I think of, well, Christian Scott is out there. I can do this. So the same way for the people coming before and after, every time they see more people like Sarah, more people like me, more people like Christian, more people like Robert, they automatically think, well, wait a minute. I don't have to take this. You know, unfortunately, some people don't even think they follow. So when they see you breaking ceilings, they may not they may not have the hammer, but they, they're there when you drill them, when you throw them the rope. So. It helps if you can be the forefront. Yeah, I'll just add too that there's something, um, you know, so often in these conversations, uh, in like helping to curate these conversations and being a part of these conversations and moderating these conversations and hosting these conversations, like the different hats that I've been fortunate enough to wear. Um, some of the conversation that happens is like, well, who do we invite to be a part of these conversations? Who who should be in this space talking about this in the first place? And the idea of involving um, cisgendered men in this space is something that I feel extremely strongly about. Because even the fact that, you know, Christian, you are here having this conversation with us, you know, there's, this is a convert, this sort of picture, like take a screenshot right now, opens up the, the door, you know? It's like, we need um, in, the, in conversations around I'm in Brooklyn, y'all, so you can hear the, you know, all the things. Um, <laughs> um, right, exactly. Um, they're coming. No. <laughs> but it's so, it's so important for us to like have a, a broad spectrum of individuals participating in this conversation so that we can see that, um, and, and a broad spectrum of individuals, this is what I was gonna say, um, who are allies in relationship to this conversation and champions of this conversation who aren't only cis identifying women or non-binary people um, who are really able to be champions of this broader scope, this larger stage, whatever you wanna call it. We've called it multiple things during the course of this conversation. Um, so I just wanted to, to highlight that and say that <laughs> as well, um, because I think that that's hugely important. Representation matters. Um, who shows up for these conversations matter. I just to add on to adding on to adding on, but you know, I think a big part of this is also the fear thing, right? For a lot of musicians, right? You're in an environment where there's scarcity. You're constantly being browbeaten with this idea that there are no resources available to you, right? When we know that there are a plethora of them, right? From our experiences and growing and learning in this music, but you know, in those moments where you are seeding, you know, this music and you're developing, you're younger, you're walking into these spaces, most people buy into that idea, right? This, this, this scarcity uh, sort of uh, umbrella. And what that breeds in a lot of spaces is this idea that you have to hoard the, the small resources that you have, right? And that turns in on itself and it starts to eat and grow and snowball into something that by the time you end up you know, if you're lucky enough to become the mountain, then what is the mountain made of, right? And so, you know, it's, it's I think those, those 
ideas are the ones that we also have to reevaluate and be clear with the next generation of practitioners in this culture of music, you know, and also the pundits around it, which is walking away from these ideas that that romanticize us not having any resources and therefore the infighting as a byproduct of those resources not being there. I'm like, does anybody else want to add anything? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, you know, I, I was going to ask, I'm like, should I ask this next question? But I feel, I feel like I want to diverge. I don't know. I don't know. Um, Do I feel like power is, is the, is the, the notion that keeps coming up, um, in this. So I, I guess I, on the fly, I may have to come up with a question. Um, yes. Agency, Sylvia Blaylock agency how do we find it where 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 is it located for each of you i guess and i and i mean that power is a process right we can't be um confused about that particularly as it relates to race and gender and the, the various other things that people place upon us when they look at us so that's a question answer it Is it me? Okay, I guess, <laughs> I, you know, I, um, what is the question exactly? <laughs> there was a lot there. How, how have you arrived at your place of power? Because obviously, you know, somebody, uh, Sylvia said something really beautiful in the chat a few moments ago. Let me just quickly scroll. She's... I got you. Hmm? I got you. Oh. you know, for, for me, um, <laughs> it wasn't... I didn't grow up in a context where I had to work to find that later on, right? I grew up in, in a context where I'm in the inner city in the ninth ward of New Orleans, but essentially growing up in a tribal community, right? My grandfather was a chieftain, you know, all of the lessons that have come down from, you know, since the 17 teens, you know, of these African persons navigating this system and learning those things, you're imparted with all of these lessons that show you your value. Right? that tell you who you are in the community that I grew up in. Right, So it's like, it wasn't so much uh, me finding my power. What it was, was learning when and where to assert it, right? And to be clear about the fact that it always existed. And no matter what I was doing, if I'm negotiating what position that I'm in, being clear about the fact that I have a stake in what it is that we're speaking about, especially when we're talking about our artistic expression, right? And I think of a lot of younger musicians when they're developing, again, that fear thing comes into play. You know, I have these conversations all the time with, with developing musicians where it's like you're 19 years old and, you know, maybe some record label says, you know, come into the office and we'll talk about doing a record deal. And because, because this guy is smiling at you and he's friendly to you, you think you're friends with a person that is essentially a shark and planning to dispossess you. So developing the the business acumen that is requisite to navigate this environment is a huge part of that but it's not just rooted in you recognizing the power you have to develop the ability to know when to harness those tools and you know so that's what it brings to mind for me yeah you know for me a lot a lot is coming up um i'm thinking about the word that lakeisha used earlier in the conversation gatekeepers um and it can be hard when we're thinking about power in this music. I, I, I just did an event last night with um, UMass Amherst with um, uh, Tam, Dr. Tammy Kernodal, Kurnod I'm gonna not mispronounce her last name, and um, Terry Lynn Carrington. And uh, one thing that they both brought up that I've been thinking about ever since last night was this idea that so often in this music, the, the gatekeepers of the music um, have nothing to do with the, with the creation of it. Um, the gatekeepers that have been in power <laughs> in relationship to this music um, aren't necessarily the people who are creating it or the people that have created it. Um, you know, there's this sort of, uh, not this sort of, there is um, a white male dominated industry as there is a white male dominated world, period, um, at this moment. And, and those, the shifts um, and the potential for shifts, I think, are, are great right now. And I'm I'm optimistic about, about a lot of it and acknowledging what it's been and why, um, why people in positions of power and why hierarchies have looked the way that they looked and haven't looked the way that they <laughs> haven't looked. 
um, feels like it's it's really important to consider and to reflect upon if we're planning on building something different into the future. You know, I think about, um, I studied jazz vocal performance in college, but I also studied um, sociology and urban studies. And, um, you know, early anthropologists and sociologists were studying, uh, when they when anthropologists specifically decided like who they were gonna compare um, humans to, um, they had the chimpanzees, our closest relatives were the chimpanzees and the bonobos. The chimpanzees were, a very patriarchal society um, or, or hierarchy um, in terms of their social structure, um, much more you know, aggressive and violent and all sorts of things. The bonobos were very collaborative, no hierarchy, um, very different structure. And white male anthropologists way back in the day <laughs> decided that chimpanzees were the choice, even though these two you know, societies were, or these two uh, animals were, were, were our closest, both our closest relatives and were sort of tied in that way. Um, I think about what had, what would have happened if they had made a different choice, <laughs> you know, if this collaborative, um, uh, uh, more collaborative, non-hierarchical and actually also matriarchal society would have been the, the, the picture, would have been the comparison. Um, so it makes me think like when, when I think of the word power, the, the things that pop into my mind are a result of like my engagement with heteropatriarchal society, period. And so, you know, in recent years, I've challenged myself, you know, speaking to friends and colleagues and great, you know, thinkers and creatives like, like Naomi Extra and Caroline Davis, who I co-teach the class with and different, different people who have kind of come into my orbit and taught me a lot in, in recent years. I've thought like, wait, how can I take a more collaborative bonobos Black feminist approach to my space, <laughs> to my life, to um, how can I make my spaces more collaborative? How can I lead my band in a way that feels open and collaborative? You know, I think it's been that way for a while, but the first couple of years, I was trying to like really put my my hand down on on what we were doing, thinking, oh, this is that, this is how you lead a band, this is what you need to do. And then I realized like, wait, let me just open and see what happens. <laughs> Christians, Christian can speak to how I lead my band. You know, it's very collaborative, very open, you know, Absolutely. almost to my de almost to my detriment sometimes. No. It's, 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 it can be complicated, but it's also, um, it, it's like the music comes first, you know, when I feel like when we get our egos out of the way, you know, then other things are allowed to come in and, I'm, I'm talking, I'm just going on. So that's what, that's what's coming up with this, with this question and that word power. Um, I think what you're, what, the way you're framing this is perfect though, right? Because I, I, I don't know if we've had this conversation before, but, you know, bonobos are fascinating to me, right? Because, you know, when you, when you look at that time period and what they're documenting, it's like no one took the, the real time to glean the lessons from the bonobos, right? There's no warring. Right, so you you have this this make matriarchal cultural system, right, that essentially walks away from all of these projections that we see as you know power in our in in this environment that has essentially been created by the frame that you mentioned before, right? And it's like, you know, I say this all the time when people ask me, people are like, you know, you know, what's what's it like producing, you know, your some of your music uh, co-producing the records with you, and I'm always like. Sarah is the dopest, baddest band leader I've ever seen. And now mind you, I've worked with a myriad of different folks, but the way that you do it is actually the most natural. It's like, you know, all of those energies you've mentioned before in terms of the command of the music, what has to happen, the charts are organized, everything. You know what this, everything that's supposed to be happening is being handled. But when we are in the space building this music, you feel the energy is so, for lack of a better way of putting it, it's the most perfect way to put it to me is, but human, right? Everyone there is valid. Everyone there feels like the things that they're going to contribute are going to be seen, they're gonna be heard, they're gonna be weighed. And to me, this that aspect of the way that you build your music has been a great example for me too. The, like tons of lessons that I've learned has also affected how I actually engage and interact with my band from actually, again, like I said, from also watching you. So, you know, I, I think when you when you point those things out and you bring that up, I think it's really important for people to, to really think about the reevaluation that has to happen in terms of, you know, why do we see the things that we see, 
you know, why do we see these narratives? Who is projecting that? Well, whose imagination is this coming from, right? And those, once we can take a, an honest appraisal and look at those things, then it helps to shift it because when you're really looking around and paying attention, no one should have any negative or disparaging, pejorative and belittling leanings about any person from outside of the normative cultural space creating in this music or any other form, if they pay attention to the radiance and the beauty of all different types of human beings. Like you, you talked about you talked about cisgender males. Like I'm thinking about all of these different people that communicate in this moment that don't get a light shine on them because they don't check one of the boxes that we say is eligible for being on the cover of said magazine or whatever. Right. And that has to change. But in order for that to happen, it also requires the ones that are doing it to be to be unflinching and unyielding in the agency that they take to make sure that they tear up those ideas. And 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 I will say part of the reason I'm jumping in is because when you bring up what it is that you bring to the table and the process that that you uh, have created in the music that you built for my adult musical life. It has been one of the greatest honors watching you lead a band because I learned so much. It's like all teaching moments, but it's because of your humanity and the fact that you are willing to actually see every individual in the room. So, so yeah, I'm bowing to you on that one. Well, I'm personally beclinked. Uh, I don't know about anybody else. Lakeisha, did you want to respond to that at all? Yeah, I could put a little something on it. I think I think the first time when I thought about power, I was probably like a teenager and someone just in passing to me said, you know, power is money. And I was like, what? And they're like, power is money. Whoever got the money got the power. And I was like, I'm not sure how, how you, I, I, could, I couldn't, it didn't sit with my soul. It just felt like whoever had the money maybe had more opportunity, but I didn't see it as they had the, all the control because I, I, I felt like I, not, I didn't know them personally, but I seen pl plenty of people with money and they had no power and no agency over what people were doing. They were just kind of like a figurehead. And then I started to realize, so to me, I was like, well, what is power? And outside of my, at the time, outside of the music I was studying, I was taking like an active effort always to be on Google and YouTube. And like, I would, instead of just checking out Nina Simone's music, I would be only checking her interviews, only checking James Brown interviews, only checking Malcolm X interviews, just to see when they spoke, what were the things that they spoke about? And did they ever mention money is power? Because in my mind, it was clear to me that in their career, they had a, a generous amount of respect. And at certain different times in their career, they had the money. So I was like, if Nina Simone is saying whatever she wants, however she wants to say it, she's on this interview threatening to shoot this man if he doesn't pay her. Clearly, there's some, there's some power that she has, and it's not about the money, and it's not if she, if she sacrifices her beliefs and values, that she won't be able to have quality of life. We're kind of taught as artists, if you speak your mind, if you say what you're feeling, if you defend your culture, if for a second you let anybody know that this is black music, you will not make any money. And that is the threat that is held over your head. If you do this, if you don't wear a nice little skirt on this album cover, Lakeisha, you are not gonna make any money. And that's kind of like the carrot they dangle in front of you. Please, you know, if you don't go this way and if you go the other way, you'll be one of those indie underground artists that we all know about, but you'll never get the accolades and respect that you have. So when I started seeing people that, like a Muhammad Ali, people that I respect in the limelight that made a stand for something and history treated them kindly, you know, while he, while he got, you know, some problems in his career, but in the long, in the long scheme of it, the legacy was left. That's when I started to realize that I don't know if power is money. I feel like leadership is like one of the greatest skills you can have to assert your power. The fact that Christian's talking about how Sarah leads her band. You know, it's easy to hire cats to play with you, but how many of them want to play your music? How many of them want to project your vision? They want to see your vision on the mainstream. They want to see what you're about. You know, they'll play your gig for cheaper money because they know that the message and the value of this can be in the history book. So I think that how you lead and watching leaders and learning from people that, you know, I got, I got the privilege of always following Gary Barter around. If he was conducting business and negotiating some money, he would allow me to stay in the room and listen to the club owners say, oh, I only have this, I only have that, and I just watch. So I can get a feel for what I'm worth based off what he's worth. So I feel like sometimes leading by example and having somebody that you can stand on their shoulders can really show you how to be your authentic self and how you wanna choose 
to be a band leader because being a band leader is not just you wrote the tunes, you have the CD. Being a band leader is mean you, you want to be innovative and changing while respecting the tradition. So that's my little take on power. But I truly believe that we shouldn't strive to be powerful. We should strive to be the best community leaders we can because that's the art. Chef's kiss. Thank you. <laughs> um, I'm also thinking about, I'm going to, you know, maybe scrap the rest of these questions because I think uh, we're in a different place right now. Um, so I'm thinking about just listening to what the two of you just said last, Christian and Lakeisha, I'm thinking about stewardship. And I'm thinking about how that's played a role for you in terms of you know, pushing against so much of what is tried to be placed upon you to say what you want to say in this space and move how you want to move in this space. You know, I think it's really important what she just said, you know, about Gary Barks. You know, I was lucky enough to be underfoot too, you know. And so it's, um, you know, when I think about what I've seen, you know, from, from, from being a little boy growing up in an environment where, you know, the people that were teaching us were the children of the originators of this music, right? And, you know, so much of how they approached that was everything was communal, right? And I think, you know, part of what I see trending in this moment is, you know, we've, we've kind of lost that energy in a lot of ways, right? You know, it's like this idea that's, you know, you, you finish, you know, high school or college and you can play a little bit and then, you, you know, you just want to show up on the scene and somebody's supposed to give you a record deal and this kind of energy without actually having to go through the process of learning. And those are the things that are really armoring for younger musicians in general is to be around elders that actually show you the way, right? Uh, you're, you're automatically going to be fortified with more if there's someone that is sitting there saying that I care about you, I care that you develop, I care that you learn these lessons, right? And so even though, you know, we're going through the moment that we're going through with the pandemic and we've lost so many folks, we still have a lot of really great musicians that are kind of in that in-between age range that have had those lessons, that have learned those things, that when this opens up, you know, I really hope that the younger developing musicians come and hang out and try and learn in that way as well, which is more of a communal system. Because this is what this music is was originally, right? It, it wasn't you know, we're trying to make the next jazz star. It's, I need you to sit down and learn how to effectively communicate with this instrument or your voice, the experiences of the human reality and family. And in order to do that, you're going to have to learn. And to do that, you may have to sit down and be quiet and actually go through this process. But the reverence that's created in that moment, also, the things that you glean from watching those experiences, like you speak about Gary Bartz, you know, I never forget my uncle Donald brought me to Impulse Records when I'm like 15, 16 years old to sit there with him in a PL meeting and the things that I heard in some of those conversations, I mean, really frightening things about, you know, how executive level folks would, the way they would use these people's masters and recordings really against them. I've heard people say to recording artists, well, no, we're not gonna service that to black radio because we don't want your music working as a bridge, right? All of these kinds of ideas, those, those ideas and energy still exist. But again, like Lakeisha said, if you're not in the room, if you're not gleaning in these things, getting these ideas, you have no context for any of that. So I, that aspect of the communalness of our culture has to come back because the lessons are there. You know, Christian, it makes me think back to what you were saying before, though, about um, about scarcity of resources, because I think part of why it's um it's not there as much um, is because of that exactly. You know, this idea that um, it's funny, T Terry Lynn was just talking about the importance of like mentorship um, uh, last night, and we were having like a sort of a sister conversation to this conversation, which I find interesting um, right now. But uh, I digress. I think that this idea that like. If, if the teacher, if the elder, if the person who is five years older than the, the other person is, um, is thinking that they are in competition with that person, even you know, in some kind of way, what does the stewardship look like? What does the mentorship look like? How does it taint that? You know, so uh, it, like, I love what you said a moment ago, Lakeisha, about community and about really centering like our, like changing our focus from power to, I'm gonna butcher what you said, so correct me if I do, but like to 
like leadership in community, fostering and like really cultivating communal spaces and community spaces in which we're valuing each other and lifting each other up for the sake of lifting all of it up, <laughs> you know, ourselves too. Um, the other thing that's coming up for me in relationship to this idea of stewardship is um, is symbols and, and accessibility. You know, I had some really amazing mentors growing up um, and the majority of them happened to be men. Um, and they were really amazing, you know, none, none the same, but it wasn't until I was about, um, you know, 18, 19, when I moved, first moved to New York, um, that I started meeting um, other women in the music who I could look up to. You know, I met Brandy Younger, who is now one of my best friends, but originally was introduced to me as sort of a someone who was a little bit older and could kind of mentor me and be by, by a mentor back home. Um, and now, you know, we're extremely close, but I learned so much. Lakeisha, you talk about Gary Barth letting you like it, be in the room while he was he was talking to the club owner about money at the end of the night or contracts or discrepancies or whatever. Um, you know, I would follow Brandy around to her gigs <laughs> and listen to her, you know, do the same. And it was really, um, really huge and formative for me um, at that at that young age. Um, and having like those, being able to go out, see music and see myself represented on the stage was something that I didn't have until I moved to New York. So that question also just makes me think about accessibility and representation and symbols um, as well, because as much as you know, you don't always need to see yourself reflected, um, there's something that shifts when, when we do see ourselves reflected, it's, it's important, um, yeah. Can I, can I add on to that too, though, just in a response to, you know, for, for, for me, when I was coming up, I think a, a big, a, something that was important for me to wrap my head around, you know, because I wanted to do this, you know, was just that there was also going to be a ton of work trying to find that tribe, right? Because, you know, not every, we're, we're, we're talking about how human beings interact, right? So not everybody's going to be nice. Not everybody's gonna say things in the frame that you like. The thing that I was, I learned from very early on growing up in the space that I grew up in is that, you know, when somebody's telling me, they may be saying something to me in an ugly way and they say, man, you really are butchering those scales. I knew for myself, they already knew their scales. So the fact that they took the time to tell me what I needed to know was a lesson in and of itself. And that doesn't mean that we accept anyone disrespecting us or getting out of bounds. But the point that I'm making is it's like, you know, more often than not, I feel like we have conversations about this, the type of mentorship that has existed specifically in jazz music and, you know, the, the positives and the negatives of those things. And, you know, coming up and playing with guys like McCoy and, you know, and being in those spaces, you know, I'll never forget one time he told me I was kind of complaining about, you know, something someone told me when I was 17 or 18 years old and how it made me feel. And he told me, he was like, well, it's not his job to be nice to you. He's giving you the information. And if you're on the path, it's once you have the information, you can choose to, to, to project light. But the, the point in the short for you, if you want this information is to just do your work and to be that that's as long as, and he said exactly what I just said, as long as this guy not disrespecting you, right? If he's giving you information that you're saying that you really need and you really want, then you draw the line and you say then the sand and you tell them where you're at and where you're not. And then from that point on, you can keep it moving. But the biggest part of that for me is always about really finding your tribe, right? Because more often than not, we go through these, these waves where it's like, when I speak to younger musicians, they're like, well, I went down and heard this cat and I hung out at a jam session. And, you know, I don't think he likes me. And, you know, I, I think, I don't know if this is for me. But when I'm a kid, you know, when Lucas and I are coming up and we're in Boston, New York, and these places, we're literally going to every space we can to get around the masters and to learn what it is that we can learn. So if you go to 70 different clubs in two weeks, chances are you will find somebody that actually is radiant and is willing to project those ideas and that knowledge with light. But that is also incumbent on you to search out, right? It can't be just the expectation that every person that you're going to meet is going to fit with, with your particular way of, you know, dealing with how you interact with people. I've, I've seen so many young musicians get turned off because it feels almost hopeless sometimes because they find this person that they thought was this because they had a record and they said this song about something they like, and now automatically they're supposed to give you all of their information. The second side to that is also that 
This is a cultural space musically that has a history, right? It has its own uh, rites of passage, initiations, nomenclature. This is a very specific thing. And so to be eligible for that information, you also have to earn the right to actually get this information, right? Part of the reason that is that way is because that culture has been dispossessed, right? So, so if, if we are completely, completely open arm to every situation, we know what that has actually breeded in our culture. We know what that turns into. It turns into a hundred years of creative improvisers and people that refer to themselves as jazz musicians being possessed. So something has to shift. The point for me is just figuring out one, who your tribe is doing the work to, to find who that person is or who those people are, but also being clear with yourself that there may be some bumps in the road to, to the destination that I'm trying to get to, but like mama didn't raise a fool and I got this armor on and I'm ready for whatever that is as well because you came to get something. So not allowing somebody else to deter you from what you came to get, you know? Like, <laughs> boom. Okay, there you good. go. Bam. Boom. <laughs> um, I think uh, uh, for me, I could just, instead of, I could try to be simple with it. We kind of like it in our microwave society. People always said that to me, oh, the millennials are microwave. And I was like, whatever, we're just emailing dog. But now I'm starting to realize that when I, <laughs> when I look at the younger generation, I, I mean, the pop, the positive things that they're focused on branding, they're focused on producing their own albums. They're focused on getting their music out there. They're not focused on the desire to constantly be learning the craft. So if you're constantly trying to learn the craft, you're constantly seeking out people to teach you the craft. You don't have to worry about, if I tell you, hey, you're not playing the changes, you don't go into a tissy fit because you know you're not playing the changes. Right. You already knew you weren't playing them when I approached you. <laughs> you're able to take the criticism and you're able to take the, the lessons. You know, it's like sometimes some of the greatest experience I had, you know, I remember Rashid Ali came up to me once and said, man, that's mm -hmm. terrible. And he gave me my car, he gave me his car and was like, I want you to come by my house tomorrow. And I came by and from that moment on, I was in his band. He's like, you got the potential and this is what's going to happen. So I think, I think we, don't, we don't spend the time earning the respect of the people that have paved the way for us to even brand ourselves and have the album. You can't just come up to Christian and say, oh, I'm doing this, I'm doing that, I'm doing this. He's earned the respect of the, his elders and now he's paving a way. You can actively make your own albums and have your own masters and do your own things because of what he's actively doing right now and he hasn't even stopped his journey. So you have to have a certain amount of respect and humility about who you are to know that you are not at that level just because you took a picture and put it on Instagram. And I think that that kind of microwave society is, is missing from the culture. It's like, it's kind of like you go to school, you meet a couple people, and then you go out on the street and you want Kenny Barron to call you. And I think that as long as we have to get back to what it was and what it was, if you came to the jam session, you might get sent home crying. But the goal is you have to have so much resilience in you that you keep coming back. You keep showing your face. You keep calling. If you want to play in my band, you need to keep calling me. You need to keep seeking me out because I'm busy trying to break ceilings so that when you become my age, you can come through them. You know, so I think there's just that's just kind of a thing that I, I wish the younger generation would focus more on rather than just taking the little TikToks. Not TikTok disparagement. <laughs> It's not about the TikTok, you know, the quick little videos, like the Charlie Parker solo, and then it's like, I want a record deal. And I'm like. And also too, more often than not, when you see that, it's like, you take a 15 second clip of you sounding good. We don't know what that really is. And I, I, I talk to my students about this all the time, you know, for when I'm growing up playing in Wally's and these different places and, you know, part of that last sort of analog generation, it's like you, no one was looking for you unless you could really play because they had to be there in person to get it, right? And it, and it doesn't mean, don't get me wrong, every single person that wants to play this music should be eligible to do it. You still have to do your work. This is, you know, and, and that's the point that I think gets missed a lot of times, right? Is that we, we you know, it's like, what, uh, what is it? Like the trophy culture, right? Where it's like you have, you know, six-year-olds and they all show up as a baseball tournament and everyone gets an award. Now, I think in, in, in terms of an energy, that's a beautiful energy, but you're also setting yourself up to have to deal with a teenager that's going to feel entitled later on, right? So these ideas have to be challenged. What's the appropriate way to go about that? But again, to me, it always starts with finding your tribe. Like you talk about, Lakeisha, you said, you know, keep calling you. The way I got the gig with McCoy Tyner was 
every night that they would play at the Blue Note, they, they did like, you know, a bunch of weeks, just maybe, I don't know, 2003. Every time they were there, I was at the sound check sitting at the bar. I never brought my horn, anything. It seemed like every time McCoy was anywhere, I was going to be there. And after about nine months of being there, maybe 20, 30 times, he said, hey, man, you're always hanging out. Can you play? Are you a musician? I said, well, yeah, I'm a trumpet player. And he says, well, can you play? I said, well, I'm, I'm working on it, you know, but this is why I'm here, you know, and I would always ask him if I could sit at the bar. He was always so kind. And then after that day, he said, you know what, the next time you come, we plan a gig tomorrow night, bring your axe. I don't care if you can play or not, I'm going to help you. And that's how I got the gig. This man had never heard me play before, right? I'm a 19 year old person, but because I was willing to actually be in the space, and that doesn't mean that everyone is going to be eligible for those things. He did ask around and guys were like, yeah, this is who that is, I'm sure. But at the end of the day, if you don't put yourself in a position to get that information, you also can't complain about not getting it. That's ridiculous. Yeah, I, I wanted to add, add a little something, um, if that's OK. Um, I, I um, some, some things are coming up and I, I wonder about uh, I wonder about a couple of things. So I wonder. I, I agree with so much of what's being said about respecting the music um, and putting in the work um, and um, honoring the legacy both uh, and the lineage, both that has been told very clearly um, and that has been erased from our history that is accessible to us if we go digging for it, right? Those people who have not been celebrated in this music as a result of you know, gender identity, sexual orientation, uh, Etc. cetera, <laughs> um, who have been written out of the history, who are not our, our, our heroes because we don't know about them, but they could be. Um, uh, that's so important and I value that so much. And one thing that's coming up is, you know, what McCoy, McCoy did for you, Christian, um, you know, that, that ability to sort of, to embrace you in that moment and to kind of take that chance and open up those doors, you know, in the same way that, um, that the mentees, I feel, or the people being stewarded need to need to step up and kind of be open and be be brave <laughs> and be willing to ask the question, right? Um, the mentors and the stewards need to be willing. So it's like, you know, people who are in our our generation, our age group and older, and, and I think of those, I think of us, and then I think of people like in their early 20s or, you know, people who are 18, just moving to New York, just like I was, you know, who are those people who, who maybe I can look out for, you know, in my student population, outside of my student population, you know, in the university setting and outside of the university setting, because those walls, you know, are, can be a lot of things and can also be very limited in terms of who's, who you find, um, you find in them. So you've got to look other places too. Um, the other thing that kind of comes up is this idea of, um, uh, of what the structure and the culture of the music has looked like thus far and, thinking about what you asked at the very beginning of this conversation, Christian, in relationship to how we can move forward differently. Um, I, I think that uh, a lot of the, the structure and a lot of the culture, as I've already said a couple of times, but I feel like it may, may bear repeating um, just in this context is like, looks like one thing, you know, it looks very specific. The jam session looks very specific. The, that environment, the, what what is considered good in this music? What is considered uh, to be genius? What is considered to be uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, what is valued uh, and held up to be to, for everything else to be compared to is very specific, um, and it doesn't mean that it's not great. It doesn't mean that there's not greatness in it. But there are other things that are great too that haven't been championed <laughs> on other parts of parts of the music that um, that might look a little different that haven't been championed. And so I'm thinking of like conversations too that I've had with Asia, who um, who's our host tonight, um, in relationship to the institute and this question, like what would jazz sound like without patriarchy? That's something that the, Inst the Berkeley Institute of Jazz and Gender Justice asks all the time. They ask their students, and I find it to be a fascinating question <laughs> and a really important one. What would this music better. sound like? Right. Better. <laughs> well, right. And it's sort of this idea that what would it sound like if we all were able to sort of take gender and instead of doing it, doing this with it, like put it on this spectrum that it actually exists on 
and let all parts of ourselves come up and out. You know, what happens, what music do I create when my testosterone and estrogen is like, they're working on the same level and I'm just, I'm just creating and just being me <laughs> and letting whatever come up, uh, whatever, whatever, um, uh, comes up, come out. Um, honestly, what does that music sound like? Um, and maybe it's not, I'm just going to use some of the sort of stereotypical, you know, I'm thinking of jam sessions in particular, and maybe I'm coming also at this from a vocalist perspective, because that is my primary instrument, but like, what, what is it, what can be great that is not like fast, loud, hard, you know, what can be great that is not some of these things that, and that have been so often valued in the settings that this music has been created in. And again, I'm not saying that these are the only things that are valued, but but oftentimes they're the things that are held up in order to be, that are held up as great in order for everything else to be compared to. Um, and I love this idea of like really opening that space more. Well, I think a big part of it is also we have to get rid of those old those old ideas that say that this is valuable and this isn't. It shouldn't be for anyone else to determine what's valuable for us. And I think as a generation, we also have to take agency and re to re like, you know, people, there's all these feelings about the, the revisionist, you know, histories. And all, but look, at the end of the day, it's important to go back and appraise what happened in the past to, to create the best rendering to it, to make sure that the next generation has as much information as possible. Anyone that is listening to this music and, and listening to a Billie Holiday, right? Anyone that is listening to this music that's listening to an Alice Coltrane that has a belittling idea about what they're contributing isn't listening. And I think also that is the energy that that has to be met with, right? So it's, it can't be, oh, that's just, you know, obviously people have their opinions about music, but like some stuff is just fact. When you hear Alice Coltrane play, there is a ton of information that is informing that. And no matter what you're feeling, uh, you, the specific feeling you're getting, you are feeling, and it is valid. So there has to be an ire with how we're actually relating to that. It can no longer be passive. Like, oh, you're right. Maybe this is, maybe, maybe that, maybe this. No, what you're saying is absurd. It's ridiculous. Just like you're saying, I know from my plane, when I, you know, and I do this all the time with, with my lady, you know, we, we have these moments where before gigs, I meditate and I focus on the divine feminine energy in myself, right? Because for me to actually speak in the most balanced way, I have to be aware of that. I have to be intentional about harnessing that energy when I play to be fully human. Now, that may not be everybody's conceptual approach or the way they think about it. I'm just speaking about how Ajua does it. But my point is that anybody that walks up to me on a bandstand and their energy is, is basically denigrating or diminishing this because they don't actually understand it or haven't been brave enough to tap into that part of themselves. The first thing that's coming out of my mouth in that moment is, is that I really think you need to take a step back and actually listen. Because if you are really listening, all of those ideas that are projections of this environment that we're in, they, they all fall away when you listen. And if this music is the sound of listening and is the sound of us referencing each other communally and saying amen to that and all right, sister to that, then that's a huge component of this. And, and I, I, do, I really do feel that that facet of it is really, really important in this moment. And hopefully the people that are watching at home, you know, glean something from that. When you hear somebody saying disparaging things about women that are creating this music or ideas about like who is better versus that, this is not, you know, it, it, it's, this is not a form of music that is based on, none of music is a competition, right? Obviously we got the Grammys coming up Sunday. Every interview I do, everyone is kind of focusing on those things. It's like, you have to know your why. But at the end of the day, the competing in it doesn't make sense because no matter what, I, I could try to sound like Lakeisha from this day until my last breath, and I will never sound like her because she has taken too much time to harness that incredible radiant sound that she has that everybody knows. I can't emulate that, right? I might be able to try and approximate it, but at the end of the day, it's her experiences that are feeding that. And until we get to that junction where we can reference and recognize that, we're going to have trouble. But it's coming. It's certainly coming. If I may, I think we're here. <laughs> I think, why are you laughing? No, because I'm going in right now. I'm like, there's like my I'm blood here, and water right here. now. 
Yes. My blood is boiling because I'm just thinking of those moments when you speak about jam sessions, you know, I'm a man in those contexts, right? And so I hear the things that guys say and the, the ideas that they're projecting in and almost all of it is completely BS. And it's based in this idea of really kind of keeping your foot on someone else's neck because you're hurting and you're in pain and you don't have the resources that you need. And, and so, you know, I know I'm going on and on, but it's just really important that we get past that. It's, it, there's no utility in it. Sorry, Queen. Reverend Christian Scott. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I actually have a tambourine for moments just like this. You're lucky that I can't get the draw open right now. You're so <laughs> if I may really, um, can I just share a thing? This is like from an essay uh, that I wrote interestingly about Confederate monuments and then they put, they started pulling them down like four months later. It's kind of amazing. Um, but in connection to black music in connection to jazz in particular, uh, black music is at once the vanguard of innovation and potentiality and the adjudicator of history in this country and in the West in general. It serves as a constant reminder, a keeper of time in a place whose bedrock is made from forgetting and selective memory. And I think um, as it relates to this conversation, this this idea of turning to the music as the way forward is really you know across race across gender across again these many categories and uh places that we've created as a modern society we have to step away we have to move forward and there's just nothing else that we can do um i think it's time to move on to the many brilliant questions that we have in the q a from our wonderful audience also i appreciate a lively and active chat so thank you all for doing that so far i think at least one of these is directed to one of you in particular so i'll save that toward the end uh sylvia blaylock has asked i'm a poet singer and speaker trying to teach quote having a voice to carry how do you convey the importance of agency both on an individual and on a community level through your art? Not all at the same time. Nah, I was just gonna say, go ahead and talk, Sarah. Um, I love this question. Thank you for this, this question. Um, I love that you, included individual and community level because I you know I think it starts it has to start with with the individual um uh the focus can't stay there you know it has to it has to it, it broadens out but I think that oftentimes um I don't know in my experience when cultivating a voice a voice that carries an authentic voice as we spoke about earlier in this conversation um for myself when paying attention to that um it's the sort of idea that like, like attraction rather than promotion, you know, people, you, you cultivate that in yourself. And then from there, it radiates out and people, people see it and people are drawn to it and people want to be a part of it and people want to know how you got it. And people that already have it are like, oh, wow, another one to usher into the tribe, <laughs> to use Christian's word, you know, um, it's kind of like, this mag, it has the potential to be this magnetic force when we do the individual work. Um, and in relationship to this conversation, it's also just making me think I, just a little caveat. I know we could have gone on the last, you know, the, that last thread for a long time and we got, we needed to get to these questions. And I think there are parallels because, um, the work just generally starts, it starts with us, <laughs> starts with the self-reflection, you know, it can happen through the music, but it happens through the music via the the creators of the music you know the humans who are creating the music who are humans before they are creators who are breathing and eating and loving and crying and doing all the things that we all do um yeah that's what comes up for me i think the, the community element as much as yes you do need to to attune yourself to that because you can, can be isolating when you're cultivating um, and working on yourself you can get isolated in that um and if i've found that if you're doing it and cultivating that radiance right the natural result of that is that it's going to have to come out, um, come up and out. Y'all just, y'all just, okay. 
one answer, one and done. Let's move on to the next question. <laughs> Unless I, it, it appears neither of you have anything to say. So I'm going to move on. Okay. Alma Watt has asked this brilliant question. You all have a mission outside of the popular definitions of success. How do you personally define success? And is that definition ever in opposition to making a comfortable living as a musician? You know, I, I've been talking a lot, so I'm trying to <laughs> chill a little bit, but it, you know, I think for me, you know, that, that question doesn't really enter my mind. You know, it's like, I wake up every day and get to work every single day. doesn't matter. You know, I mean, my family, they look at me like I'm crazy sometimes, like, you know, will you take some time off? But, but this is what I love to do. Right. And having the opportunity to complicate and clarify the narratives that have been superimposed about who I am, who we are, um, you know, having the ability to get up every day and to, to, to commit to doing that is really what I live for. So I guess in that sense, th there's a success, but you know, it's, for me, I also know that I'm in here every day and I'm making mistakes and, and going through the process of messing up. And, you know, like right now I'm built this prototype harp and you know, developing a methodology, but I'm essentially a beginner in it. And it's it's hard work, right? But to me, that's having the willingness to get up and to confront that every day is what success actually is, right? But in terms of framing it that way, that's not something that I do. Hey, Ama. So for me, I think I learned this lesson luckily early on, you know, deep in those college days of ramen noodles and like, you know, rich crackers. I sat down and, and I thought about it. I said, man, there were so many ideas. People were telling me, oh, play a hip hop gig, do this kind of gig, do this kind of gig, and you can make enough money to pay your rent. And I started realizing that part of the, the process of being a musician is knowing that the universe and the creator is on your side at all points, as long as you're living as your authentic self and expressing the message and the purpose that you were put on earth to do. Once you abandon your purpose, then you start getting into these weird places of how can I eat? How can I live? How can I define success? What is the success to me? Success is living your purpose and your dreams. And for me, influencing the next generation and creating legacy. That's just my particular reason I feel I'm here. So when you, if you're thinking about the money of it, and it used to bother me, like musicians, you know, older musicians used to tell me, we don't do this for the money. We do it because we love it. I'm like, yeah, but you're definitely paying your rent. You're definitely here giving this master class and making money doing it. So I try not to think about how the money is coming and try to, and the more I find that I live in my purpose and what I'm supposed to be doing, the more I find opportunities present themselves, even within this pandemic. Like this is the worst financial time for musicians. But I find that as long as I keep going in that direction and doing the work, the money keeps coming. And I'm not saying it's a name it, claim it type of thing. I'm saying it's trusting the universe and the faith of it and putting in the time. You know, I've spent a lot of time creating opportunities for myself. So rather than spending all my time waiting for a phone call to come my way, I've decided to be like, I will be the phone call for someone else. So if you start living in those ways and doing what you need to do to elevate yourself, I think that success comes way peace of mind comes, spirituality comes, having a comfortable place to live because you are defining what's comfortable. You're defining, this is what I need on the road. This is what I need for myself. And people are listening to you because you are the leader. So that's a short way to say it, but I just say, keep living in your purpose and don't let the business of those, mon those gigs that you're just doing for the money make you lose your passion and love for what you're doing. I found myself on several wedding gigs back in the day forgetting why I was even in the business. I'm making money and I'm living better than I was, but my soul is crushed. I don't have the, the joy and I can't live my purpose. I can't make an album that's gonna inspire anybody because I'm over here playing soul man. So just live your best authentic life. Everything that you should just said, that's all. I mean, yeah, everything. I mean, I personally like Sam and Dave. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> okay, next question <laughs> from Caroline Davis. 
And this question is for everyone. What do you think is the best way to uncover or discover one's internal biases? More specifically, once you discover them, what's the best way for folks to transform them or be aware of how they are affecting their actions? Brilliant, brilliant question. Thank you so much, Caroline. So I'm gonna jump in a little bit. Um, I think a, a big part of that is being willing to be uncomfortable, right? And to put yourself in positions that maybe you don't see yourself in, right? Um, to, to audit spaces that you feel like maybe you're not eligible for, right? To also walk into to spaces that you know, maybe you're persona non grata in that space, but how do you change that if you're not willing to confront it, right? And so, you know, obviously we all have biases. Every human being has them, you know. We, we grow up, we learn things, we observe things and we conclude. And, you know, the cognitive dissonances that grow in those moments when you're young, sometimes it's really difficult to break those things down. So this is why it's also important to have friends that are willing to call you on your shit. Right, I know that might be, seem like really simple to most people are like, oh yeah, well, that's a given, but it's true, right? You know, if you're in a space where you're, you are, you know, and I think a lot of times for musicians, you know, once you get into a certain junction, most people are just telling you yes, right? But it's important to make sure that you surround yourself with people that are willing to be honest with you about your stuff, right? Because more often than not, you know, when you are interacting with most people, you don't have a mirror in front of your face. So you don't know what it is that you're projecting. And a lot of times the things that you're, and I've, I've gone through this myself and had to challenge myself and to learn more about how, what I truly think and feel and why I truly think and feel certain things. But sometimes it's also important to ask questions, right? So if I'm in a space and I can feel the energy is like, you know, people are perceived, maybe the perception of me is maybe feels different than what I want it to be. That's a perfect opportunity for me to be like, is there something that I said or did that is creating this energy? Because at the end of the day, if that's not your core heart space and where you're coming from, it's just an opportunity for everyone to learn. So I, I think the sort of ego element of that, right, that says that, well, whatever I say or however I react, like people are just going to have to deal with that. That energy to me doesn't foster a lot of growth. And so, you know, I think it's important just to be able to take a step back and to get with your tribe or your camp and ask questions. And when you're out of bounds, be willing to apologize and, and work on yourself to make sure that you stay inside the lines as, you know, as it relates to respecting people. Yeah. Yeah, acknowledgement of everything that Christian just said is so important. I think in an acknowledgement, you know, the, the first the first like step is to acknowledge that you have that there's a that there's a problem or that something exists, right? Awareness. Um, I won't call it a problem because it's, it's inherent to all of our experience that there'll be some sort of bias um, or lens via which we see the world based on our own personal experience. Um, I think that in terms of like your, my personal space or your personal space some things that have worked for me, um, it is sort of challenging myself to move through the world and kind of question my thoughts. Um, you know, when I see someone walking down the street, when I'm interacting with someone, what are the assumptions that I'm making about them? Um, you know, whether it's a stranger or a friend, you know, what are, what are the things that are going on in my head right now that do not have to do with this present moment and what this person is like, sharing with me or or like that doesn't have to do with like the beautiful bird in the tree what are all like the assumptions and the judgments and the um uh the things that i'm i'm really that aren't helpful and that aren't based in reality that are based in in sort of an illusion or a uh a fiction story that i'm that i'm telling myself based on those inherent biases and based on my own personal experiences and when I'm able to kind of do that in a quiet way, in a solitary way, I find that, you know, I can then do it in a community as well. I can then be the friend that, that calls someone else out or challenges my friends. And I can also be the friend who is more receptive to the challenge. Um, also, I'm just thinking about language because I feel like that, that plays a big role um, or has played a big role for me. You know, even just something as simple as like always saying, um, like, oh, hey guys, you know, to a room full of whoever, you know, or 
it's just like certain things that um that kind of like automatically that don't feel like a big deal but then also automatically kind of exclude um uh, certain people um or make or make assumptions or just or just perpetuate certain constructs um so really challenging myself linguistically too like what how, what is the way that i speak and how do i uh what is the language that i use um and so in those moments of pause you know when i am able to interact with someone that I might be assuming something about, maybe I'll make a different choice after that pause and that moment of internal reflection uh, in relationship to the to the words that I use when I'm interacting with that person. Um, yeah, I don't feel like I'm being super clear, but that sort of that the community, everything that Christian just said about community, I think is huge. And this sort of more solitary work. Um, one thing I'll just say too, one thing that we do that Caroline asked this question, Caroline and I do in our class our jazz and gender classes, we um, we give uh, an assignment um, for students to reflect on their creative musical environments that they find themselves in and ask them to uh, to see if specifically gender identity um, uh, or sexual orientation play, if they feel based on their perception plays a role or played a role in any interaction that they've been in um, over X period of time or throughout the course of their lives and to reflect upon that but in the context of their own inherent bias. So knowing that they can't reflect upon that and tell that story um, from any other perspective but their own and without any assumptions. <laughs> there's no way to objectively tell that story. They have to, there's their subjectivity in that automatically. Um, and that's that kind of like assignment is something that I've done for myself too. Like ask myself, like what are the environments that I've, that I've been in and the spaces that I've been in where, and you can broaden the scope, we can talk about gender and sexual orientation. We, we can also talk about age, race, uh, physical abilities, you know, so many other things um, that kind of intersect to uh, to color our perception of people and how they move through through the world and spaces. Uh, yeah, so those, those types of kind of reflective kind of assignments or exercises are things that have really helped me uh, in my own individual journey in addition to the community elements that Christian spoke about. Also, I just want to tell you, you were abundantly clear. There was nothing unclear about that. <laughs> um, Lakeisha, did you skip? Cool. Uh, actually, you're in the hot seat, though, because this question is for you. Um, could you talk about your decision to center the music of both Alice Taria Coltrane and John Coltrane on your recent recording? Uh, that was a super deep process for me, uh, trying to have figure out how I could uh, emulate what was going on. But ironically, I have heard Alice Coltrane's music before I heard John Coltrane's music. I had a friend, Georgia Ann Muldrow, who was friends of the Coltrane family, and she had played me Turiya Ramakrishna. And I didn't know Alice Coltrane or anything. You know, I was just, you know, making my way into jazz. And I was like, man, this is awesome. This is beautiful. Like for me, it didn't have a category. It wasn't, I wasn't like, oh, this is a jazz song. This is a hip hop song. It was just like, oh, this is a sample. I was like, oh, this is great. So I was listening to that and it caught me to make me start searching through all of her albums. So in the process, I bought every album she had. And, you know, then I was looking at the liner notes. And when I looked at the liner notes, you know, she just mentioned briefly, you know, she's praising the creator and, you know, all thanks and praise and blessings to John Coltrane. And I was like, oh, it's amazing. She has a brother. I'm gonna hit Google. So I Googled the brother. And all this stuff comes up. I was like, oh, it's not the brother. Definitely not the brother. So I said, okay, how am I going to work this out? So I said, okay, he's probably got, you know, a few albums, not as many as her. Let me just buy two of his albums. I went to Tower Records and I, I, I interacted with the John Coltrane section of music. And I said, damn, this is all off. You know, I, I should never tell anybody this is happening to me. But I went about it. I told the guy at the store, I said, I don't have a lot of money, but I need to buy these albums, all of them, and I need them in chronological order. So he, I saved up. I came down there. He gave me all the albums in chronological order, and I played them for like the course of whatever, six, seven months in order. So after being only familiar with her music and then learning about him all the way from like, let's say, post bebop all the way to his last album, his interstellar space times and his like sonship experiences, I felt like I became familiar with who he became, the kind of man he was, and the kind of woman it took, you know, to even be with a man like that and, and, and what kind of bond that must have had. It almost to me felt like the music was like the yin and the yang. 
you know, they, it sounded so much of the same to me because I had so much experience in her music. When I was doing this album, my goal of the album was to show what we're talking about legacy, legacy, tradition, and to kind of emulate what I've experienced in my life, like to show and highlight the people that have brought me up and raised me up and do that through three different generations. So when you're dealing with people like Gary Bart, Dee Dee Bridgewater, Ron Carter, Reggie Workman, I, I said, who on the planet was the, the catalyst for them? Who was the role model for them? And then it became clear to me, because of my love for John and Alice Coltrane, that that was what I wanted to do. And it, it became clear to me that also that Alice Coltrane wasn't getting the respect on her name that was deserved. I had been to the ashram. I had been there and, and studied the chants with her. I had been there and I said, if music is truly a spiritual experience, if we're truly artists living in this spiritual, spiritual beings being in this presence, how is her music not as important? And in almost some of her music, when you listen to it, there are no drums. So if you're just a person listening to music, you're not hearing genre. You're, you're hearing a beat in your head. You don't even know. You're, you're, you're making the soundtrack yourself. So I just felt it was really important to highlight what it is to be a complete artist, to reach the highest level of musicianship, to reach the highest place you can go in your spiritual self, to reach the highest place you can go to inspire other people. You know, the, the stories of John Coltrane practicing, you know, 18 hours a day. Gary Bartz told me a story once that he went to a club to see John Coltrane. And the police knew John Coltrane's playing tonight. The club closes at four. He's going to still be playing. We're going to give him a ticket. So the police are waiting for this guy. John Coltrane's playing. Let's be outside the club at four o'clock. So when he's on the Love Supreme, we're going to get him. And the club owner said, like, hey, they're going to be doing this. So, so Coltrane, of course, obliged. They shut it down, 359 or whatever they're going to do. And Gary Bart said he was slow to get up and leave the club. And he watched Elvin Jones taking his drums to the basement. So he said he didn't know what they were doing, so he followed them. He said that John Coltrane and Elvin Jones finished their gig in that basement for God knows how long. That's how important the music was. That it wasn't just about the set, the club owner, the money. It was about... We are here for this purpose and this message. It's, it's the fire inside of me is so deep that I can't even get it out. So when I think of what I want to become as an artist, when I think of, you know, we all love music. When I think of how passionate it is to me, like, you know, the times I've cried on stage, the times I've watched my audiences cry, the times we've shared and been vulnerable with each other, that is the true place it is. When we come out this pandemic, we're not going back to just shucking and jiving on stage. You know what I mean? The type of interaction and community we need after something like this of being separated for so long is going to be a truly transforming experience so I feel like that album is taking me to the next places that I'm trying to go and it was kind of like a catalyst for me to, to move on to the next phase of my life so long story short that's what I was uh, thinking about you took me through a lot of emotions just now <laughs> thank you so much um, okay, so we have a few more questions. And again, if you have questions, feel free to pop them into the Q&A box on the right bottom of your screen. Question from Candice Hoyes. Hello, Candice. Thanks for everything you're sharing tonight. Have you found any new or unexpected sources of inspiration while we have mostly been off stage? I have for sure. Um, you know, this this time period has been um, really strange for me because you know I, I started touring when I'm about 13 years old and was on the road consistently until March, <laughs> right? So I've never had a moment where I could actually sit down and and really dig into and check out new things or old things, you know. And uh, so, you know, I I thought it would be um, really good to go back and do the work of, of excavating the harmonic realities that actually seeded creative improvised music, bam, stretch, jazz music, right? And uh, because so much of how we actually frame uh, what this music is, post it being uh, labeled as America's classical music, is, is based in this really strange frame that my feeling is that was created for this form of music to be worthy of inclusion in the great arts, which is that it is European harmony and African rhythms, right? So you, you know, if you, you go into Google and you look up jazz, they, they, you'll give a 
a general history about the music, but when you reduce it down, more often than not, these are some of the ideas that are projected. And as a New Orleanian, someone that grew up in this reality and seeing those things and how it actually affected the, the actual culture that created it, right? I have students that would come up to me and say that jazz music is not our music, right? That it belongs to other people. And I took exception to that because here I'm looking at a six-year-old child that thinks that he has nothing to do with what this music is. And so for me, uh, that journey took me into, uh, you know, listening to some really, really old spasm music and blues music from the turn of the century, Louisiana blues, you know, lead belly, these sort of folks. And, um, and wanting to, to find and figure out where the harmonic temperament of this music was actually seated. And um, the last year has really been about me excavating that, learning, you know, that Wusalu music from Mali, Shanghai music, right, Mande music, all of this, specifically Mali, Senegal, Gambia, this region for New Orleanians, a, a lot of the folks that ended up being enslaved in these places came from there originally. And when you listen to the music that comes from those spaces, it sounds frighteningly similar to Robert Johnson. It sounds frighteningly similar to Lightning Hopkins and all these things. So the blues was really seated in those spaces. Maybe what they were expressing was a little bit different based on their experiences in, in that they were not going through a transatlantic experience. Uh, but I thought it was important to excavate as much of that as possible. So I started to learn the Kamala and Doso and Donis and the, and the Kora and to learn some of the traditional music from those spaces. And then about seven months ago, I started to build a, a, a prototype that we're calling Ajua's Bow that is essentially based on a Kamala and Goni and a Kora mixed uh, sort of uh, methodology, mixed methodology. Uh, but the instrument was literally created so that I could bring this back to New Orleans specifically and hand it to the children in my community so that they could learn to play this music on an, a template that actually linearly relates to their ancestry. So, you know, having the time to do that from being off the road, this is honestly, you know, I know people are going through a really hard time and this situation is, is really a mess, but for me to have the time to be able to do that, none of this would have existed if COVID hadn't happened. Right. And so, you know, I'm grateful for the time, but this is really what I've been on. The creation of Ajua's bow and excavating the true and first blues uh, from Mali and Senegal and countries like that. You know what? I'm going to I'm going to reach into this draw and get the tambourine before we go. <laughs> What's happening? Does anyone else want to answer that question? Oh. Yeah, I can just add briefly. Um, you know, I think um, this this time is like is so is unlike anything that any of us have lived through and um i know for me it's been uh it's been a bit of a struggle finding new inspiration you know um uh, like locating that um or at least it was until I, I realized that what i was living through in real time like what was happening like could be the the inspiration in a, in a way that i didn't quite realize maybe because i was too close to it um, uh, so mostly during this time, I feel like I've been working on developing, you know, of course in new spaces and in new, you know, present moments. So it has, you know, it has, it has new flavors, but I've been working on material that that's been in development since, since before COVID. Right. Um, but anything new that's going into either that material or that's being created right now for me has largely been informed by a space of, of grief, of grieving. Um, this year has been like a year of a lot of loss um, for me in my personal life and for many of us <laughs> in different ways, you know, whether it's people that we've lost or, or so many other, other things um, that just look different um, and really kind of delving into those relationships um, with some of the people in my life that I've lost this year and allowing for like that depth of love and grief to come out um, in my, my creative space um, has been a really new source of inspiration for me and has led me on and it is leading me I'm still on it I'll be on it for a while but down sort of this this completely different path in relationship to uh, what I'm willing to reveal in what I'm creating um, in the spaces that I'm willing to go to in an effort to to be honest and and my authentic <laughs> self in this moment and also to to share um 
because I know that other people are going through it too. Um, so that that's kind of what comes up comes up for me, Candace. All right, Lakeisha. <laughs> All right, uh, so we have two questions, but I think um, we only have about five minutes left. So I'm probably gonna have to pick just one. I'm sorry to whichever one of you, if I don't answer your question. Let's go with the wild card, Warren Bradley. I'm a visual artist. I constantly find that the work is quote, not good enough, even though others are appreciative. I wonder if any of you ever feel that way and how you get past it. When it's not good enough, I use that as motivation to make it exceptional, to make it undeniably talented. Like, oh, okay, that solo wasn't good enough. I use that as a challenge. It's almost like an athlete we use, like, oh, okay, the layup wasn't cool. I'm gonna shoot from the backcourt. You know, I use it as a way to fuel myself to know that I can be better. There have been artists that are better than me that, that I've sent them demos of my thing, like this, I want you to produce my album. This is what I'm working on, oh my God. You know, and I'm thinking like I've tried my hardest. They're at least going to say this is awesome. And they write me back. Do you think you could dig a little deeper? I'm like, there is nowhere else to go, brother. What do you mean deeper? But I started to realize that sometimes we don't push ourselves. We do what we can do. We do what we do well. And other people see things in us more. Like on this past CD I work with, I work with uh, Michelle Deggio Cello. She was the only musician on the album that I actually sent the track to. And she didn't record with us. I sent her this track and she sent me back some bass and some strings. I only asked for bass, but there's all these strings that came. And when I listened to the part, I was almost like, what is happening here? It was, it was so, I said, I said, what is going on? I was like, just solo the bass. Let me just solo it and go back and listen to this bass. And it was in that, that moment I realized she hears the song at such a high, a higher level than I can hear that she's not allowing this song to maintain this level that I'm, I'm, I'm working at. She's like, that's cute, that's nice, but this is where you should be. I actually called my musicians in again, and I said, we're gonna record the whole thing again over that bass so that we can get to the level that we need to get at because she's not standing out here, we're standing out. So I would, for you, Warren, use that as inspiration to become your best self because when the art is undeniable, you won't be getting those no's so much. You know, We got the gatekeepers and stuff, but certain things, we live in a different society. Maybe Blue Note won't let you in. Put your work online. I bet you you get a following. It's happened. It's here. Anybody else? <laughs> Christian also has a tambourine. You can't see it because he's not on screen. Sarah, you know, maybe. I wanted to just, I just, yeah, I wanted to read this question again. I, I think I see it, right? I don't know, maybe. Oh, there it is. It's in the answered question one. Um, you know, when I think about who who's judging my work or who, there it is. It should be in the- Even though others are, pre there it is, yeah. I constantly find that the work was, work is not good enough, even though others are appreciative. I wonder if, so it's like your judgment of the work that's that's interesting to me because um there's definitely something to be said uh for like wait this this isn't done this needs to be better we need to go deeper um and I find that like sometimes like I I never quite feel like something done <laughs> ever <laughs> you know even when like I'm getting ready to put it out it's like oh man like maybe you know so for me, like the release, uh, the releasing, like the acceptance that like any sort of representation, creative representation that I put out into the world or that I create and feels like, like, okay, this is, I've done the work, I've done the, the deep dive. Um, and now it is time for me to release it so that I can, so that something else can come up. Like, I think it was um, Stevie Wonder who said that he wrote a song a day for like 25 years or something like that. And of course, the majority of them, if you think of that number of songs, we have never heard. And he claimed that, you know, the majority of them were trash. You know, that's not, that's not, <laughs> that's probably not true. And, you know, to think about the, the, 
depth of craftsmanship that it took to be able to do that and the depths that he got to in his craftsmanship in doing that practice. Um, and that sort of practice of like letting it come up and out and letting it go, letting it come up and out and letting it go, letting it come up and out and letting it go. Like that, there's value in that too. Um, so yeah, even though it's never quite, I see you in the chat, Warren, never quite done. Uh, I feel like there's there's a sort of like a part of it that comes, part of it that can be helped by like just acceptance and saying like, all right, this is me in this moment. This is a snapshot and I've done the work and here you go. And I'm gonna let that go so that the next thing can come up. I, I'm just gonna add on to that really quickly. I think it's also really important to understand that we are all in a process of growing, right? And so where you are right now may not be where you are in 10 years or two years, right? And so at the end of the day, you, you still have to, you know, I think it's important for you to appraise what it is that you're doing and from where you sit to say to yourself, well, okay, maybe this isn't where it needs to be and to continue to sharpen it, to get it to be as close to that rendering as, as you see it. But at the end of the day, I think it's also important to know, and this is this, I tell this to my students all the time, you know, everyone's, you know, you make your first record and everyone wants it to be perfect. Well, that at the end of the day, what is that, right? That doesn't really exist. What's the story you're trying to tell? What are you trying to offer in this moment? What should we be receiving from this moment? So thinking, wrapping your head around those sort of ideas, I think also helps you get outside of the kind of uh, if I'm being really honest, the, the kind of mental space that we've created in this space that says that everything has to have a very specific, this has to be this kind of valuable to be valuable, right? Because if we're being honest about that, like we look at artists now, uh, like a Jean-Michel Basquiat now, right? And someone, you look at, you go into the MoMA or these incredible museums and you see his work and you say, well, this, this, this is incredibly riveting work, right? But the stuff he was doing as Samo is equally as important. That got him to that junction. So really the point that I'm making is just that it's also okay to know that there is a trajectory that you're building and that you are in the process of learning and growing. And knowing that as, as like Lakeisha said, if you put the time in that it will sharpen itself as well, as long as you're committed to that and take agency. <laughs> Stop laughing at me. <laughs> Listen, I can't, but it's, I'm so happy. I'm like smiling ear to ear. <laughs> okay. Thank you all so much. This has been really incredible. Um, it's a little after nine. I'm so grateful. What an incredible conversation. What beautiful insights. What heartfelt responses um, to both the questions that I asked as well as the questions that the audience did. So thank you all so much. And of course, thank you to the audience for riding with us for two hours. Um, uh, just last bit of housekeeping. So on Saturday, we'll have the final uh, conversation in the Winter Jazz Fest 2021 season, again, hosted by yours truly. Uh, it's a series that I developed for this year's uh, programs called Fertile Grounds. Uh, so that series brings together visionary artists across disciplines to discuss their inspirations and pursuits through their creative practice. Fertile Grounds is a celebration and an acknowledgement of the expansive spirit of creativity which feeds, moves, and inspires us all. This weekend, we have the incredible pleasure and fortune to be joined by Matana Roberts and Jarrett Key. So two artists who are working across disciplines through music, through visual art as well. So it's gonna be an incredible conversation. That's at 3 p.m this Saturday. You can, of course, find more information at the Winter Jazz Fest website. I will pass it again to Asia Burrell Wood again to take us home. Thank you all so much. Such a pleasure. Thank you so much, Nyama. Thank you, everyone. Um, Lakeisha, Sarah, Christian, for such a powerful, dynamic conversation. I think, Sarah, you uh, said it best. This was going to be a vulnerable, maybe our most vulnerable um talks in their series and it was so rich and also echoing uh Alma Watt here and thank you all for your generosity in um in your responses and uh in engaging in this conversation today so I want to thank everyone again um thank you to Bryce to the Winter Jazz Fest so wonderful to be in partnership with the new school 
Um, and I'll, and we are always glad at Berkeley Institute of Transgender Justice to um, be partnering and in community with each and every one of you. And to our attendees, thank you. You were also very active and thoughtful in your questions. And um, please do continue to follow all these beautiful, brilliant people you see on your screen today. I believe everybody's on social media. So if you don't follow them already, please do. Continue on checking out the Winter Jazz Fest. And we uh, hope to be able to move these conversations forward um, on and off screen. And we will get off screen uh, <laughs> soon when we hope. <laughs> we hope, we, we're looking forward to those days. Um, but thank you all again. And we, you can hang out for a little while. We'll be having some music as we close and we look forward to seeing all of you again. Violet sky, she spills over violet sky. Why she a show to great man? She gives sight to people blind. Endless hope where. Style, see you.